Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Mark and Bev. That was beautiful. Thank you very much. Mark, or, uh, Mike and Denise, thank you so much for the Sabbath school time. That was great. And I love the, uh, the, fire, the firefighter thing. And all, any Sabbath school, if you need any autographed glamour shots of me, I've got some in my office to take with you with any gifts you want to give to anybody. So uh, free of charge. I won't, I'll, for free, I'll give them to you. But isn't it great to get out and give things, to do things for others, to be a blessing, to be a blessing. Uh, what made me somewhat nervous is when you knock on the firehouse and there's nobody there. <laughs> what are they going to do if the firehouse is on fire? I mean, come on now. Maybe you light a match and then they'll all come to the front door, right? Who knows? Who knows? But happy Sabbath, everybody. If I asked you how your week was, would you be able to tell me? You would expect our children to come home from school. Hey, how was your day at school? Fine. Well, what would you do? Learned. Did you have fun? Yeah. Okay, well, that was a fantastic conversation. I love you, too. But you know what? Whenever I talk to my mom nowadays, if I talk to her more than once a week, more than once a week, I pretty much can tell her everything that's happened in my week in one conversation. If, if we talk a second time, I got nothing for you. It's the same old, same old. I went to work. I came home. I ate. I slept. I did all the mundane routine stuff. Because isn't sometimes life just routine? You find yourself talking about the same things, and you look back at your week and say, hey, did anything exciting happen this past week? Well, um, my wife loves me. That's exciting. Okay. Well, let's have opening prayer. <laughs> but ex- what happens? What happens to our weeks? We come to the end and we look back. And what difference did we make? What, what lasting impression did we leave? W- were we remembered this week? Did anybody else stand out to us this past week? Will anybody remember us from this past week? Did you have a conversation with somebody, an experience with somebody that they will never forget you again? And God calls us to make a difference in people's lives. He's called each one of us to be Christian, to be Christ-like. And what was Christ like? He was a difference maker. He came in and he changed lives. And when people had conversations with him, regardless of the outcome, they never forgot him. The rich young ruler never forgot him. The woman at the well never forgot him. I'm not saying that we go and do things extraordinary, 15 seconds of fame, whatever, to leave a mark, but to make a difference. To make a difference. And that's what God calls us as Christians to do. And that's what God calls us as a church to do. Because God does that himself. He makes a difference in our lives. And my prayer this morning is that he makes a difference today. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, you can speak and create. And Lord, as your word speaks today, I pray that you would recreate in us a clean heart, a pure heart, that you would recreate the image of God in our lives. Lord, if there's something in our lives that has dirtied up the image of God, Lord, I pray that you'd clean us up, that you'd make us whole. If healing needs to take place, God, I pray for your hand to, to be laid upon our lives and you would heal. In whatever area of our lives that needs the master physician's attention, Lord, I pray that we be, Lord, I just pray that we would surrender. May we surrender now to the word of the Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 9, where our scripture was taken from. Last week we talked about the, uh, the decree that Cyrus put out in Ezra chapter 1 in the first year of Ezra's reign after he toppled the Babylonian Empire and he released the Jews, but only not even 50,000 Jews went back. 
So really nothing was keeping the Jews out of, out of the promised land anymore. They just wanted to stay in Babylon. So it kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of deflated, deflated the, the balloon, I guess you could say, and all that excitement, the buildup, and what Cyrus was expecting didn't, didn't come to pass, and so now there's a letdown. And Daniel, in his answer for the 70-year for the prophecy, wanting to know about the, the return of the exiles to the promised land, doesn't necessarily get an answer to the 70-year prophecy, but he's given another 70 prophecy, and that's a 70-week prophecy. And we're going to start fleshing this out today. And I want to start in verse 25. So you are to know... And discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now this prophecy is 70 continuous chronological weeks. Just because it's mentioned as seven weeks here and 62 weeks here, and this last week to make the 70th week here, doesn't mean that it's in different parts in Earth's history. It means that different things happen at these different points in the 70 weeks. What's interesting is, is we don't know exactly what marks the end of that first seven weeks, but that's 49 years after the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem first went out. And we're going to discuss that as far as when that decree went out. Now, what we do know is from Gabriel's, when Gabriel came to uh, Daniel, and just to refresh our memories a little bit, back here in verse uh, verse 21, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously. The previous vision is chapter 8 of the ram and the goat, the little horn, and the 2300 evenings and mornings. So this same angel, Gabriel, from the previous dream, comes to answer him now. And it says in his extreme weariness at the time of the evening offering, he gave me instruction, verse 22, and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight and understanding. I've come to help you understand the previous vision. Now he's already helped him understand the ram and the goat, the little horn. What Daniel does not understand is the 2300 uh, evenings and mornings, the prophecy that takes place there. So now I'm going to tell you the answer. Daniel, for the past 13 years, didn't understand. Maybe he didn't think he would ever get an answer, but finally in God's graciousness, he has come to not only give Daniel an answer, but to give every follower of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ an answer after these words were penned on paper. And this is the answer. Seventy weeks have been decreed, have been cut off for your people and your city, Daniel. They've been cut off. Now, if I have a 10-foot rope, any pathfinder should be able to know this, and anybody who's gone to school should know this. But if I have a 10-foot rope and I'm out there camping, and I only need three feet, what am I going to do? I'm going to cut it off. I'm going to cut three feet off of a tree limb. Am I going to cut three feet off of someone's muffler? Am I going to cut three feet off of my pant leg? What am I going to cut three feet of? Rope. And so when we talk about cutting off 70 weeks, 70 weeks is a time, time period. And the only time period that has not been explained to Daniel is the 2300 evenings and mornings. So we're going to cut off from time, since this is time, we're going to cut off from time, from the previous vision, Daniel, that you don't understand 70 weeks. The first 70 weeks of the 2300-day prophecy belongs to the Jewish nation. And Daniel doesn't know when it starts. He doesn't know if it's already started. He doesn't know if it's off in the future or if he's standing in it when they return from Cyrus's decree. So what Gabriel says is, it's from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's when the 70 weeks begin. And ultimately, that's when the 2300-day prophecy begins. So then we have to understand, when does this decree go out to restore and, and rebuild Jerusalem? There's two elements to this prophecy of restoring and rebuilding Jerusalem. The one thing that's been taken away from the Jews is the temple sacrificial system. There's no priests officiating in the temple. The temple was destroyed. But also, 
Jerusalem as a nation has been taken away. For the past 70 years, they've paid taxes and they've lived in Babylon and wherever else they've been exiled to. Now they're doing it to Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire, but now Cyrus is returning them in Ezra chapter 1. In Ezra chapter 1, Cyrus decrees that you can go back and restore, rebuild, to rebuild the house of the Lord. But that's all he decrees. He only decrees rebuilding the temple. And so in Ezra chapter 1, and ultimately in 538 B.C., that decree goes out. Now I want you to turn back with me to Ezra. Ezra comes right after 2 Chronicles. Turn back with me to Ezra. What's interesting is the very end of 2 Chronicles, in the Jewish Bible, in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles is the last book of the Bible. And the last book of their, of their Old Testament Bible says that uh, the, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. You know how long it took Nebuchadnezzar to realize that, it, that God had given him all the kingdoms? Roughly four chapters. First four chapters of Daniel it took for Nebuchadnezzar to finally realize God gave it to him and he didn't do it for himself. But here, immediately Cyrus knows that this is an answer to Jeremiah, Jeremiah's prophecy. Jer Ezra chapter 1 starts off by saying, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Verse 2 says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me. He has appointed me, Cyrus, to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So Cyrus takes it upon himself to make this decree and fund the whole project. That was the very first decree. Now there was a second decree, and that decree is in Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6, King Darius is the king. Now this isn't Darius the Mede that Daniel knows in the first year when he's thrown into the lion's den. Darius the Mede was a, was a regent king under Cyrus over the Babylonian Empire. This is a different Darius. This is in 519 B.C. Darius gives the decree to search the archives for Cyrus's decree because there's been a halt. Some people have come and protested. And so uh, uh, Darius has said, well, let's go back and let's look at the archives and see what was actually decreed. So they go back and they look at the archives. And in verse 6, or I'm sorry, verse 3, in the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree. So they found this decree. And as a result of finding this decree, in verse 6, therefore, uh, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shathar Bazanai, and your colleagues, Colleagues, the officials of the provinces beyond the river, keep away from there. Keep away from Jerusalem, from them building the temple. He goes on to say, Leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on this site. Moreover, I issue a decree. And the decree goes on to say that out of the taxes which I collect, we will pay for the rebuilding of the temple. But this is still only a decree regarding the rebuilding of the temple. The Jewish nation has not been reinstated as a political power, a nation yet. This is only involving the temple. And it's not until 457 B.C. Now this is in chapter 7. All three decrees are in the book of Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah deal with the rebuilding of the temple, rebuilding of Jerusalem. And it says here in chapter 7, starting in verse 8, he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. That king is in verse 1. That's King Artaxerxes. So King Artaxerxes, in his seventh year of reign, issues a decree. Verse 13, I have issued a decree that any of the people of Israel and their priests and the Levites in my kingdom who are willing to go to Jerusalem may go with you. So the priests and Levites can go back, ultimately, to minister in the temple. But then it goes on to say, we also inform you that it is not allowed to impose tax, tribute, or toll on any of the priests, Levites, singers, doorkeepers, Nethanim, or servants of, his house, of this house of God. So now you can't tax the priests and Levites. What if pastors were not taxed? How many pastors would we have in the United States of America? Can we, I know we can... We can propose a bill from the floor, but could you imagine seeing me on C-SPAN? I know that guy. 
That's my pastor. Sorry to interrupt. I just have a bill I'd like to propose. Um, it reads that no pastor in the United States should have to pay taxes. And you know what? I'm going to take it a step further. Anybody who leads out in song service, amen, amen. How many song service leaders are going to have? Anybody who's a doorkeeper, amen. No doorkeepers pay taxes. Do we tax Germany? Does the, American, does the United States of America tax Germany? Do we tax Australia? I mean, I know my, I'm not the, a political buff or a government buff. Do we tax citizens of Mexico? Do we tax Canadian citizens? And the answer is always no, because they're not United States citizens. Now, if for some reason we got together with the Canadian government or the government down in Mexico, and we say, hey, listen, why don't we just have one big North American government? Then maybe we start taxing all these people. But the reason we don't tax them is because they're their own separate entity, nation, government. And the reason he's saying we are not going to be taxing the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers is now they are becoming their own separate political national government. So now not only is Artaxerxes restoring them as a temple service, restoring the worship and religion of the Jews, he is now restoring the nation of the Jews. It goes on to say in verse 25, You, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river. Because up until this point, the Medo-Persian government has, play over, has, has placed people to oversee the judging and the governing of all the people. Now they will no longer govern and judge because they are their own separate political, national, government entity. They will oversee themselves. We do not oversee the Australian government because they are the Australian government separate from us. And now this is what's happening to Jerusalem. In the third decree, in 457 B.C., the decree goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem And from this point, the 70 weeks begins, and ultimately, the 2300 days, the 2300 year prophecy begins. But let's focus on the 70 weeks for a second. When we look at these 70 weeks, 70 weeks, a week is is seven days. But when we talk about 70 weeks in prophetic time, we're talking about weeks of years. So we're looking at 70 weeks worth of years, which is ultimately 490 years. Now, what the prophecy says here in Daniel chapter 9, that after the 62 weeks, now he says there's going to be 7 weeks and then 62 weeks. Now, that's 69 weeks. That leaves that one week that's left to be dealt with or explained. Now, 69 weeks is 483 days, but ultimately, prophetic time, 483 years. Do you realize what the date is if you add 483 to 457? You get to A.D. 27. A.D. 27. Now, Gabriel tells Daniel, and ultimately God is telling Daniel, and ultimately God is telling everybody that what I'm going to do is I'm giving the Jewish nation 70 weeks to accomplish six things. I'm holding this other finger up here. Six things. And these six six things are this. To finish the transgression to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, the one thing we talked about last week is to anoint, the Hebrew word for to anoint also means Messiah. So when when David is anointed to be king, he actually becomes a Messiah. Aaron, when he's anointed to be high priest, when that anointing takes place, Messiah means to anoint. And so when he says to anoint the most holy, we're talking about anointing. We're talking about the Messiah. Not just these little sub-Messiahs over here. The Messiah. 70 weeks to accomplish these things. And we're going to kind of work backward here on this list. Now, these six things are paired up into three groups. And the first group, working backwards at the end, is to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
In A.D. 27, something uh, miraculous happened. Amazing happened. It was actually in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. Now, Tiberius' father passed away in A.D. 14. So if you add 15 to that, you get actually A.D. 29, except for the fact that Tiberius began his rule two years before his father passed away because they voted that to be a co-regent ruler. Solomon did this with David. Solomon sat on the throne while his dad was old and gray lying in bed. But he fulfilled the throne and the kingly office. So Solomon acted as a co-regent but fulfilled the kingly function. Tiberius fulfilled his function for two years before his dad passed away. So when you actually, it's A.D. 12, he takes office for the next 15 years, puts it at A.D. 27. And in A.D. 27, the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, Jesus Christ steps into the waters with John the Baptist and is baptized. 483 years after the decree went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Jesus Christ is baptized. Now, we all were baptized. But what makes Jesus' baptism is different is that he was anointed for his earthly ministry and mission on this earth. Because the heavens opened up, the dove came down, and a voice came from heaven that says, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. After he goes into the wilderness, the devil's challenging him. Are you really the son of God? Well, yes, I am. Because God just told me that I am his son in whom he is well pleased. In A.D. 27, the most holy, Jesus, the most holy. Jesus says, destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. Jesus is the most holy. And he was anointed in A.D. 27. And that begins, that, that's at, after 69 weeks, right there. After the 483rd year, he's anointed. So then you have that last week. So seven years after that, now later on in the prophecy, it talks about how this Messiah is cut off in the middle. In the middle. Now what's half of seven? Three and a half. And what happens three and a half years after, how long was Jesus' ministry here on earth? Three and a half years. Three and a half years crucified after three and a half years. And do you know what happened three and a half years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? The stoning of Stephen. So seven years right there. And in the middle of that seven years, completing the 490 years at the end with the stoning of Stephen, now you may say, well, there's lots of martyrs in, in the Bible. I mean, when you look at the book of Hebrews, it goes through the whole list. It even says people were sawn in half. I mean, even Peter was, was crucified upside down. John the Baptist, well, he died on an island, but even, didn't James die a certain way? And didn't Paul? Well, what made, James, what made Tim, or, uh, Stephen's death so important was that right before he died, do you know what he said to all these religious leaders? He laid out a covenant lawsuit against the religious leaders. And he goes back to Abraham, and he goes through the whole history of the Israelite nation and says, this is how you've broken the covenant. You stiff-necked people. Brothers and sisters, there's a covenant that God has made with his people. There's a covenant you made with your spouse. You promised your spouse that no matter how rich you get, you're going to love her. You promised your spouse no matter how poor, it's easy. Well, money, 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 money money. I've seen things divide. I've never seen a dollar bill cut through butter. But I've seen it cut through a marriage. I don't use money to cut carrots. I don't use money to cut bread. I don't use money to go out and cut a tree down. But money, money, money is used in so many different ways to rip things apart. And you made a covenant with your spouse. That no matter how poor you are, no matter how rich you are, it's always going to be them. It's always going to be them. You made a covenant that no matter how great things are, 
Let me tell you, brother, it's easy to spend money when things are great. It's easy to love when things are great. But you also made a covenant, a vow, that no matter how bad it gets, and each one of us has a basement, but then the devil wants to take it to a whole nother level than you ever imagined your basement to be. No matter how sick, no matter how healthy, no matter what, we made a vow. And here's the thing. We break that vow. I've broken that vow. And this covenant that, that I made with, with Jesus Christ when I got baptized, I've broken that. But do you want to know something? God has never and will never break that covenant with you. There will never be a time where you can say, I'm justified because God broke. No. God always leads by example and fulfills his end of the covenant. And not only does he fulfill his end, but then on the cross, he took our end. He took our end. Abraham, I'm going to cut all these animals in two, and I'm going to walk through it. You sit over here. I'm going to walk through this. So that if any one of us breaks this, I'm taking it. Get that cross. Put it on my back. I'm taking it to Calvary. You sit over there. I don't care what, come, what words come out of your mouth. I'm taking it to Calvary. And each one of us he took to Calvary. And today, he wants, God wants to take each one of us to Jesus. He wants to take us to the throne, the mercy seat, where we have mercy, not a wagging finger. The literal, the literal translation, when it talks about sealing up vision and prophecy, it's not prophecy, it's prophet. Stephen was the last prophet because he witnessed one of the credentials of prophets as a message from God, and he saw Jesus standing there, standing up for him. And when he declared that message to the Israelites, to the Sanhedrin, they gnashed their teeth. They bum-rushed him. And from that moment on, this 490 years was completed. There's a, there's a parable I think it's a parable. It's in Luke, where Jesus talks about this, this vine dresser, this owner, where this tree's not producing any fruit. And so what he does is he tells his servant, go cut it down. And the servant says, no, 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 just give me a little bit of time with it. Let me fertilize it. Let me nurture it. And let me see if I can get some fruit out of it. And the one thing about that parable that we never find out of that story is we never vi- revisit it. We never find out what happens to it. The story ends without us ever finding out if it produces fruit or not. And we're talking about Israel here. Where will it will it accomplish what i've what i've given it to do and we're going to talk about what god gave it to do but will it accomplish it but as we look at the end of the 490 week 490 year prophecy gospel went to the gentiles didn't mean that didn't mean that they didn't minister to to anybody of the jews but as far as the avenue which which god used to reach the world he now used the church instead of a nation he uses the church to accomplish that goal. Working backwards a little bit, it says to make atonement for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. There is only one thing that will ever atone, and it's not getting on our knees, walking up steps, and kissing every step, and reciting a prayer each time of repetition. I don't grab something around my neck and say something 500 times for any past or future sins I may commit. There's only one thing that atones for our sins, and that's the Lamb. And if I sin, back in the Old Testament times or before the cross, if I sin, I bring a Lamb. And that Lamb covers the sins I've committed. But do you know what I have to do when I sin after sacrificing a Lamb? I have to bring another Lamb. And then you know what I have to do when I sin after that Lamb? I've got to bring another one. And do you know what I have to do after I sin after that one? I've got to bring another one. And I've got to keep bringing it. 
because it's just a lamb. It accomplishes nothing. It's temporary. It only provides or makes atonement for, symbolically makes atonement for, what I've just done or what I'm confessing. It doesn't deal with what's coming down the pipe. And what they say is, in this 70 weeks, you're going to make atonement for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. Everlasting And if I show up at your door today with a check for $10 million, you may not keep your shirt on. You'd be so excited. It may get somewhat illegal. You'd be so excited. It'd be coming out of your skin. But when we talk about everlasting righteousness, it's another term we hear when we go to church. In Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, it talks about how the Lamb was never supposed to make anything perfect. But let me read this to you. In Hebrews chapter 10, if I can get there soon enough. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, For the law, since it it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. These sacrifices in the temple could not make anybody perfect. It was symbolic. It was supposed to be by faith that God would come in through this and the promise of the cross, the promise of the Lamb coming down and dying for us, that we would be able to be made perfect. Because it goes on to say in verse 14, for by one offering, He has perfected. By the offering, by the crucifixion, by the sacrifice of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ, He has perfected those who are being sanctified. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are now perfect in Christ, and He begins His work of sanctifying your life. Our work until Jesus comes is sanctification, brothers and sisters. And just as Moses and all those Hebrews walked to the promised land, you and I are walking to the promised land. Are we walking to the promised land? Are we looking back at Egypt? Did we ever leave Egypt? Are we still in Egypt? Are we still in Babylon? I'm going to get into this in the, next, in, the, in, the, in the coming sermons. But in that Egyptian exodus, they exited one nation. But when Cyrus made that decree, they were coming out of all the nations. So it wasn't just Babylon or Medo-Persia who was going to see this exodus. Every nation was going to see Jews packing up their things, walking out, and going home. Can you imagine the witness it would be today if people from every language, tribe, nation, and location were packing up their things because they're going home? When I was in college, I had a friend one of the most amazing testimonies I've ever seen or witnessed. I had him come up and give a testimony in Sabbath school, but he took all of his video games, his movies, everything, and put it in a pile. Thousands and thousands, his game system, thousands and thousands and thousands worth of dollars. And he set it all on fire. Why? Because this isn't taking me to the promised land. Brothers and sisters, there are things in our lives that are not taking us to the promised land. They're taking us somewhere else or they're keeping us where we are. And we have to come to Jesus to allow Him, allow Him to take us to the promised land. And that's everlasting righteousness. When we give our lives to Jesus, He makes us perfect. We don't make ourselves perfect. This isn't a negotiation. We're okay, God, you can do this, but I'm... No, 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 no. I do everything. I've already done everything, and I'm going to do everything right now. Just let me do it. Because what's interesting, we get back to the very first part of verse 24. It says that, it says, to finish transgression. Do you know what transgression is? It's rebellion against God. When we transgress His law, not just the Ten Commandments, it's when we transgress His character. When we do things that are not founded in the divine biblical love. Everybody's got their own definition of love nowadays. No, no. You've got to go to the Bible to find out what love is. Because God is love. He defines love. And he's going to tell me what love is. So if I say I love this, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Is that my definition of love or is that God's definition of love? Transgressing God's character, who he is and who he claims to be and who I claim he is. And who I claim he is by how I act by being a follower of Jesus Christ. To finish transgression, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin. Gabriel was telling Daniel that Israel has 490 years to get rid of sin and prepare the way for the Messiah. John the Baptist's whole ministry was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Make way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, bring the mountains low, bring the valleys up, prepare the way of the Lord to put away sin and dwell in a righteous society, a righteous way of living. And it wasn't for them just to prepare those with a Jewish heritage. Can you imagine what life would have been like on this earth if the Jews had not been kicked out of the promised land, but had been commissioned out of the promised land to go to the ends of the world? The Great Commission is not a one-time event. Abraham fulfilled the Great Commission. He went out and was a blessing to all the nations. And God said, your descendants will be a blessing to all the nations. So God wants me to be a blessing to all the nations. He wants us to go everywhere and be a blessing. Instead, they hold up within their walls because they were scared of being defiled or contaminated by everybody who was outside. And they waited for this Messiah to come and put them over the Romans. The book of Luke, Jesus says, listen, you look out there for the kingdom to come. It's coming in your heart. It comes within you. So we can preach about the second coming of Jesus Christ, but the second coming of Jesus Christ is nothing if I don't talk about the coming of Christ into your heart. I'm not walking through those gates of heaven until Jesus Christ walks through the gates of my heart. None of us are. And we hear people in song service, or, hey, we want to see your glory, we want to see this, we want to see this. You know what? A lot of people want to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, hold up one second. Be careful what you ask for. Because there's going to be people at the end who says, I did all these things for you. You know what Jesus is going to tell them? I don't know you. I don't, I don't care what commandments you kept. I, don't, I think I'm a, I'm a law-abiding United States citizen. You know who I don't know in this life? I don't know President Obama. I didn't know Bush. Bush didn't know me. And no matter what I do when I walk into the White House, I pay taxes. And I'm a pastor. Can we do something about that? I keep the speed limit 20% of the time. Okay, I won't say that. I was born and raised in the United States of America, and I have never called another country my own. Let me in. I have never said anything bad about any president. Let me in. It doesn't matter what you or me ever do does not get us into the gates of heaven. It is what we let Jesus Christ do by coming into our lives and fulfilling his work of sanctifying our lives. Jesus says, it is me who does this, not you yourself. So stop trying so hard. Just open the doors and let me come in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Some people are trying to clean their house up before Jesus Christ comes in. And you know what this one guy did? Jesus tells a parable about it. He got his whole house in order. You know what the problem was? He never filled it with God. It stayed empty. And those demons came back with seven other demons more wicked than himself, and they ripped that house apart. And the minute we try to clean ourselves up without inviting Jesus Christ in to do it for us, the devil's going to have a heyday on you, brother. And all this time, while you think you're sanctifying yourself, the devil is just piling it on, piling it on, and ripping you apart where you are worn out and have nothing left because you never had anything to begin with. Jesus has it all. Jesus has cornered the market on your salvation. If you want it, you've got to go to him.
And we don't sit here and say, well, when I get my act together or when you get your act together, you can come to church. I don't go to the hospital and brag about how healthy I am. At least I'm not, at least I don't have what this person is. I mean, this accidentally happened to me. No, I'd go to the hospital because I need a doctor. And we bring people to church because they need, they need Jesus. And we're here because we need Jesus. Not to tell other people. Not to wag a finger. We're all in the same boat. We just got different holes to fill. Just got different holes to plug up. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is coming. He is coming. And the message that John the Baptist had in the spirit and power of Elijah was repent. Walk away. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That same spirit of Elijah will accompany the second coming of Jesus Christ. That spirit is not the spirit of Elijah. It's the Holy Spirit that comes from the throne, that comes from heaven. And just like it was poured out at Pentecost and the, the word, the gospel went nuts, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out again, again on God's people. And the word of God will move powerfully, powerfully in this world. Because we are called to prepare this world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you called the Jews and you gave them prophecies and oracles and you gave them prophets. You gave them the temple. You gave them everything for them to declare to the nations around them. But they got caught up fighting the nations around them instead of serving them. They got caught up in separating themselves from the nations around them instead of blessing them, instead of ministering to them. Father in heaven, I pray that we don't separate ourselves from people to try to keep ourselves clean, but by, because by doing so, we don't accomplish anything. We defeat the purpose. We are blessed by being a blessing. God, I thank you for the testimonies of our Sabbath school classes to give food, to give money, to give gifts. God, we are called to be a blessing in this community. Father in heaven, we know you're coming soon. And I pray that we use our relationships to be able to tell people about Jesus. That yes, we can give someone a gift basket, we can give someone food donations, we give someone financial blessings, but all those things are temporary and they're not the end. We use those as a means to take the next step, to tell them about the end. But more importantly, tell them about a new beginning with Jesus. Because yes, Lord, you are coming in the clouds. But before that happens, you've got to come into our hearts. God, I pray that you come into the hearts of the people here today. And God, I pray that you come into the heart of this church and that everything this church beats, that this heart beats, that it beats Jesus. To God be the glory, great things you have done. Amen.